Let's jump right in goals. Share my Christian faith, share my atheist faith, and inspire you to do both of these things at the same time. The tools I will be using is the King James Bible. Feel free to use a different translation if it's your favorite. I was raised on the King James Bible, so I'll be using that one. You will also be using your mind's eye, your imagination. I'm going to be asking you to leave your body, not literally, but in your mind's eye, and float out with me to different times and different places. And we're going to use logic and do, you know, logic and reason, do some uh, thought experiments and reason some stuff out. Jesus did say that we are to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. So we'll be definitely be using our mind today. A good place to start is usually the beginning. In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. For this video, however, we're going to go before the beginning or really outside of time or outside of the beginning. Because it says, in the beginning, God created. One of the things that God created in the beginning was time. So I'm remember, I'm asking you to float out with me in your mind's eye. And we're going to go visit God before or outside of time, before anything else existed. Just God. So come out with me in your mind's eye to when it was just God. We can see in this Bible verse that God creates the soul before any physical part of a man. I don't think the Bible says if God makes souls like one instant before he places them into a new embryo or if God made souls before he made anything and then places them um, in the human at the right time. I don't know. But it doesn't matter for this thought experiment because remember God's outside of time and you can see by this verse that he already had made all the plans for this person before he even started to make his physical body. So for our thought experiment, we're going to float outside with God prior to when God made anything physical. And at this instant, he's made all of the souls that will ever be. And they are those souls are with God. They're nowhere else because there's nowhere else for them to be because there's nothing else yet. This verse does beg the question, though. If God had already planned out this prophet's entire life uh, before the prophet had any physical thing about him at all, and if God knew this soul before he put the soul into the physical body that didn't exist yet, did that person have free will? Did, did they get to choose if they were a prophet? Or, like, is it just God's will and there is no free will? Whatever God wants is done. Let's, um, let's look at Judas and see if we can puzzle this out. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Can't God make Judas to betray Jesus for... God's plan, but then did Judas choose to betray Jesus, or did God build Judas to betray Jesus because it was necessary for mankind's salvation? And if that's the case, where is Judas right now? Judas did exactly what God foretold Judas would do. Judas did exactly what needed to be done to fulfill God's plan. 
What does God do with people that do his will? As we'll see later in the video, prophecy fails, love never fails. I believe Judas is with God. What about the everlasting fire and the everlasting torment that is mentioned in the Bible, even by Jesus? The Bible is perfect for finding God. The Bible is the flawed, floundering faith journey of the people that wrote it. Look at these amazing logical verses by Paul. For whenever there shall be prophecies, they, for, they shall fail. For we prophesy in part, we see in part. We see God through a glass darkly. You know, because we are flawed, finite humans that can't understand infinity. We're stuck in three dimensions and we travel in a fourth. God is like a seven dimension being. He, he, he's not bothered by these types of constraints. And we can't comprehend seven dimensions. He's really infinite dimensions, but, you know, I say seven because it's a fun number. When we meet God face to face, that is the first time that we will know him completely the way that he knows, the way that he has always known us completely. But we don't get to know God completely while we're finite, three-dimensional, limited beings. We are not capable of it. It will not be until we become perfect beings in heaven that we can understand perfection when we see God face to face. So for now, I perhaps you have been told that the Bible is the perfect, unflawed word of God. Right here, I just showed you a verse that says, prophecy shall fail. The only thing that doesn't fail is God's love. So how can we know what God wants? I'm going to tell you. The Bible records a, an attorney trying to trip Jesus up and asking him, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds that it's to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. But then he adds, he adds a second thing that the lawyer didn't ask for. And he says that this second thing is likened to it. It's the same. That's what it means to me. It is like unto it. And that is to just love your neighbor as yourself. And like, if you think about the Bible and what we've already talked about, prophecy failing, blah, blah, blah. You look at some of the stuff in the Old Testament. Don't eat bacon. Wear your hair a certain way. Wear certain clothes. Do this, do that. All these crazy rules that don't make sense. They, it's okay. They don't need to make sense. None of it matters. Don't worry about tradition. Don't worry about what your preacher tells you. I have shown you scriptures that you can read them yourself. Go back and read them again. I have shown you scriptures that show that love is the only thing that matters. And you remember you're supposed to use your mind. So... What you're supposed to do, well, what we are supposed to do is use our mind to make sure that we're loving our atheist and our Buddhist and our homosexual and our Mormon and our Catholic and our Christian, etc., 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 neighbor as ourself. The rest of the Bible, like when someone's pointing some one specific verse and they're like, oh, this is exactly what God wants today. We don't know what God wants today. Prophecy is only part 
of what God wants. I've already showed you the scripture. Prophecy will fail. Only God's love won't fail. Plus, God is in complete control of everything. So God's will is going to be done whether you do it or not. doesn't matter. And look at that amazing last line. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. Everything. Every single thing that matters hangs on these two things. And remember, we don't really know exactly what God wants because the Bible's flawed. So we can figure out what God wants if we can figure out how to love our neighbor. That is the only requirement. Don't get tangled up with ministers or Christians that try to tell you there's just one specific way to be saved and then they want to show you a specific verse that proves that their way is the only way. This is the part where I said that the atheists are right. The atheists, the atheists are right in that the God that's demonstrated in the Bible can't be as he's portrayed because the Bible is self-contradictory. So, and atheists prove free will because if there, if everyone willingly believed in God, then you might question if we really have free will. So, if you're a Christian, I invite you today to find an atheist and go have lunch with them have a pleasant conversation, talk about something nice, share your beliefs, and may neither of you be sure that the other is wrong or right before you start talking and when you're all done. That, that would be, that's what I want. I want Christians and atheists to sit together peacefully. Do you want to impress Jesus with your faith? Check out this woman. This is one of my favorite Bible stories. I, I was raised that I wasn't allowed to ask questions. It was called backtalking. <laughs> but check out this verse. This woman basically backtalks Jesus. You can read it for yourself. Essentially, like, well, she was a Gentile. And she was like, Jesus, Jesus, save my baby, save my baby. And Jesus like, totally ignored her because he's like, oh, I'm only here to preach to the Jews. You're not the person I'm supposed to preach to. Go away. So then the woman's like, Jesus, Jesus, save my baby, my baby. And um, Jesus' disciples like, oh my gosh, will you make that woman shut up? But she persisted. And like, look at the verse. It ends up saying that Jesus marveled at her faith. Think about that. Like, Jesus had 12 disciples. They spent years with him and seen all of his miracles. They're supposed to be the people he chose to believe in him. Here's some woman that's from a completely different faith, that's outside of the religion. She's not even supposed to be part of that church right now. And Jesus ignores her. Her disciples ignore her. She persists. And then Jesus is like, dang, woman, you have faith that's cray cray. And then he saves her daughter, even though that wasn't what he had planned to do. So don't let your mommy or your daddy or a preacher or your friend tell you that they know what Jesus wants. They don't know. You're free to argue with Jesus about what Jesus wants. Go ahead, do it, argue with him. I encourage you to. And that is the other way that atheists are right. Cheers.